Perfect. <laughs> so yeah, hi everyone. Um, welcome to the um, ISPRIM UK and Ireland Early Career Research Conference. Um, my name is Alex DeLacy. I'm um, from Goldsmiths University of London, also the um, Early Career Researcher representative for ISPRIM in the UK. Um, we're joined here today by um, Beata Peter and Simon Sikorsky thomas also from ISPM, who are going to be chairing um, the two other sessions with me. Um, but I've got written down here that we have a welcome from Professor Simon Sikorsky thomas so maybe you'd like to say a few words. <laughs> yeah, here. I'm not going to say very much because you've just said pretty much the um, what, what needs to be said, which is welcome. Um, as you can see, I'm being blinded by um, bright sunlight ploughing through my windows. But um, uh, yeah, just uh, to start off by thanking Alex for organising this. And uh, it's such a, a, a great idea to dovetail the, um, the global lecture series into this ECR conference. I think that's... Um, that's wonderful stuff. And um, I don't think I need to say any more than thank you again and thank to everyone who's, um, well, all the contributors and, and to the uh, welcome to everyone who's uh, come to watch and listen today. I'm looking forward to it a lot. Great. Thanks, Simon. So, yeah, in terms of how today is going to run, um, we've got three sessions. So, um, the first session um, is going to be chaired by Beata and it. Um, we're going to have Rowan How Howitt's presentation, Alice Masterson, and and Adriana Sabo's presentation, and then we're going to have a short break, and then we're going to have session two, which kind of looks at process and production, and then we'll have another break, and then at half seven we have the global lecture series presentation from Hamad Rashid, which is a longer presentation. Um, the sort of format for sessions is they sort of twelve to fifteen minute talks, and then there'll be some questions and answers. Um, feel free to, um, yeah, to feel free to once once the presentation has been done, sort of raise your hand, or you can put if it's if you're not able to talk, you can put your questions in the comments, and one of us can read those out for you. Um, I have got a Twitter hashtag um, if you want to use that for today's session. I'm not sure how much traction it will get, and I'll put that in the chat here as well, um, and I'll be posting a few things from the IS from Twitter as we go along. Um, but yeah, I just want to thank everyone who um, who's here today to to um, to present their work. It's a really exciting uh, array of really interesting talks. Um, so yeah, I'm really excited to sort of see what the um, evening entails. And thanks to people for finding time to to come on a sort of Thursday as well. Particularly as it's really really nice weather outside. So I'm sure we're going to sort of like give it some opposition with some really interesting sort of musicological work. Um, so maybe we could should we just start. Does that make sense rather than sort of waiting nine minutes for um, the first session? Does that make sense? Okay, great. So let's um, commence with the first session of today and I'll, I'll hand over to Dr. Beata Peter. Hi, everybody. Um, so it's a great pleasure to host uh, the first session. I have to say overall, for those of you who are here, um, we were very impressed with the submission of abstracts. And what we could see is that um, postgraduate researchers and ECRs are really pushing the boundaries in terms of interrogating um, phenomena, either new phenomena or phenomena with very new methodologies. Um, so <laughs> we really struggled kind of to, to, to decide who's going to be part of this program. So what you will see today is, is really kind of top-notch research that we're very excited to present. So the first session um, that I'm chairing is called Futures, Legacies and Representations. And as you can imagine, it has to do with new developments, but also ways in which we question legacies, the way legacies have been represented in the past. This is where the first term, uh, the third term comes in representation, but also whether there are methodologies that help us to illuminate um, on the legacies and how we've presented them in the past. It may be 
help us to create new historiographies of popular music research. So it's my great pleasure uh, to introduce Rowan, Alice and Adriana, who will be presenting in that session. And if you don't mind, I would like to kind of keep to, to that particular um, order. So um, Rowan is starting off um, her presentation with the musical ecologies of grief, extinctions, breath and climate justice in the UK. Um, before I hand over, um, I, would say, I would say let's do the three presentations first and then we take collective answers from the floor, so to speak, or the ether after the presentations have all been over. So if that's okay for everybody, then uh, without further ado, I'll hand over. Thanks very much, Beata. Uh, it's really nice to be here and thanks to uh, Alex and Simon and everyone else for organising. I will share my screen just now. So hopefully you can all see this. Perfect, thanks. Okay. So musical ecologies of grief, extinctions, breath and climate justice in the UK. Before I start, I just want to offer a content warning that discussions of illness, death and grief will follow. I also want to pay my respects to all victims of environmental and climate change, past, present and yet to come, including Ella Kissy Deborah, and I ask that we keep them at the forefront of our minds. Music is so often present at moments of loss and grief. I think of the Keening traditions that wakes in Scotland and Ireland and of the significance afforded to the choice of music at loved ones' funerals. What happens, however, when grief is on a huge environmental scale, when we are forced to confront current and future losses in a world marked by anthropogenic climate change? In recent years, the term ecological grief has come into use to describe the grief felt in relation to experienced or anticipated ecological losses including the loss of species, ecosystems, and meaningful landscapes due to acute or chronic environmental change. A large swathe of the UK population is in the privileged position of being relatively sheltered from environmental change, certainly more so than, for instance, indigenous communities in low-lying Pacific islands or in the wildfire lands of Australia. Nonetheless, ecological and climate change are being felt here day to day, often by the poorest and most marginalised. In this paper, I'll consider how climate or ecological grief manifests in two recent projects by musicians in the UK. While music's psychotherapeutic capacity to aid those suffering from the feelings of despair and anxiety which accompany grief has been much researched, music and ecological grief remains unexplored. I'll therefore briefly consider how the music of Cosmo Sheldrick and Love Sega addresses ecological grief, which is both reactive to loss and anticipatory of emerging losses. I suggest that music helps us to inherit ecological grief responsibly, focusing not just on healing trauma, but on interrogating our own responses to injustices. So onto my first case study. Wake Up Calls is an album released in 2020 by multi-instrumentalist and alt folk musician Cosmo Sheldrick. It's composed entirely of recordings of birds who are on the red and amber lists of endangered British birds, nightjar, cuckoo, bittern, amongst others. Cosmo recorded these birds around the UK before arranging segments of their calls on a sampler, which you can see here in the picture. Each call can then be played in harmony with itself or with other species. Now the red and amber lists designate that a bird has seen significant decline in numbers in the UK. Most featured on the album have declined by at least 50% within just the last 25 years. The album itself is structured around one of the most familiar temporal frames, the cycle from night to day and back again. Each track features a different bird who's active at a particular time. So wake up calls begins with a nightjar and a nightingale, proceeds through such birds as the skylark and bittern, and concludes with another nightingale and an owl. In this sense, wake up calls is cyclical. By the time we hear the nightingale for a second time, the album could well have begun again. The sense of continuity and cyclicity is also present on each track in the album. I'll play an extract from Owl Song, the final track, which samples the calls of the tawny and short-eared owls. <laughs> So 
So as you can hear, uh, like the rest of the tracks, it loops those harmonic progressions in a kind of chacon like state of repetition again and again and again. The music itself could easily cycle round ad infinitum. Yet this begs the question of when the music, and therefore the bird's calls, will stop. Cosmo says that the aim of wake-up calls is to try and highlight some of the beauty that we're losing in this often unconscious way. The sharp decline in numbers of the at-risk birds heard throughout the album has been caused by a variety of factors. Chief amongst them, according to the RSPB, are agricultural changes, including a loss of hedgerow habitat and an increase in monoculture farming practices. The birds' migratory patterns and ability to feed and breed are therefore being disrupted by anthropogenic ecological change. The recordings heard here are therefore sounds produced by species which may no longer exist in a few decades' time. To me, this is reminiscent of literature scholar David Farrier's notion of haunted time in the age of mass extinctions. Farrier suggests that we're living in a time haunted not by ghosts of the past, but by future ghosts, humans and more than human beings, whose lives we are currently in the process of altering. The bird calls heard across the album therefore arguably conjure up spectral voices of individuals who may or may not be able to exist in the future. The threat of loss and uncertain futures and a sense of grieving were evident in the comments in the YouTube videos for this album. These are, I think, worth quoting in full. So YouTube user Zoe MG commented the following on the video for Owl Song, which we heard. This song sounds like grief, like owls are calling you closer and closer to a shadowy forest. It seems to make me feel like something is missing. I have no idea if this makes me feel alive or makes me feel empty. Like out of all his songs, this one gives a slight unsettling experience to me. In response to Cuckoo Song, Mothman said, this song gives me a sense of mourning the loss of something that I haven't lost yet. But at the same time, it's all about a bird with a pretty song. It's like someone is projecting the thoughts I have with the rhythm of a song, not the words. And finally, on the same video, Not Raymond's commented, it's weird to think that one day these songs and other videos and pictures might be the last records of some of these animals. Shame really, most of our grandkids, kids, might never experience nature at its fullest. Wake Up Calls thus brings listeners into an intimacy with the voices of species not yet lost, but whose fragile existence haunts our current situation. This is a prime example of anticipatory grief. Various terms such as eco-anxiety and solastalgia refer to distress caused by environmental change while still in that environment. But what does it mean to memorialize extinctions through sound and music before the fact? The concerns for grandchildren outlined by Not Raymond and Mothman's notion of mourning something not yet lost speak to music's ability to disrupt our usual temporal ordering of grief. The album, for these listeners at least, conjures up a haunted, uncanny, speculative grief, whereby uncertain futures and intergenerational concerns rupture the present. This is arguably a form of preemptive memorialization as resistance to loss. Wake Up Calls is ultimately self-effacing. If the album succeeds in its goal of resisting the loss of these sounds, it won't ever have to function as a memorial. If they are lost, a memorial it becomes. Anticipatory grief is held in this album before the total extinction of these species, leaving space and time for awareness to be raised and regenerative action to be taken, time to wake up to the destruction at play. Climate change and environmental degradation, however, are also causing human loss and suffering now. Moreover, this loss and suffering disproportionately affects people of colour and those from low income backgrounds. These issues are addressed in my second case study. Our World, Fight for Air, a single released in April 2021 by British Ugandan artist Love Sega. Our World was written as part of Season for Change, a cultural programme which highlights underrepresented artistic voices in climate justice and activism in the UK. The single focuses on the impact of poor air quality on the communities who live in Lewisham, near the South Circular, a ring road around central London which has some of the highest levels of traffic congestion and air pollution in the UK. It is written in memory of Ella Kissy Debra, a nine-year-old who died following severe asthma attacks in 2013. Ella's home was just 25 metres from the South Circular, and in 2020, a coroner concluded that illegal levels of air pollution from the road were a significant factor in her death. 
making Ella the first person in the UK to have air pollution added to her death certificate. Schools with the highest percentage of non-white pupils are exposed to average levels of NOx, a prime air pollutant from motor vehicles, that are 28% higher than schools with the lowest proportion of students from BAME backgrounds. There's a similar difference of 27% between children who attend schools in the most and least deprived areas respectively. Working class people of colour like Ella are therefore more vulnerable to the effects of air pollution in London. This is a form of environmental racism in which minority groups are more exposed to life-threatening pollutants. Our world is therefore a work about the inequalities of breathing. In the music video, Sega raps while standing by the South Circular as positive smiling footage of Lewisham residents living their day-to-day -day lives is montaged. I'll play a, a short extract from it now. Welcome to our world, South Circular, it's more than a thoroughfare For people who want to live, breathe and reside here And if peaceful protest is to be banned, is it not underhand? For those of us who don't want to work hand in glove We just want to have a hand in love Look after your family, stay alive, please HGV, six axles, 44 times, two inches and 54 foot on top of that As it circles around ourselves, happily chugging and leaving our children's lungs back NO2 means something to me, but what does it mean to you, or do you not care? Because you think you're in an area that's for the well to do. So much of the rhetoric in the single centres on notions of community care and hospitality, best represented in the opening line, Welcome to our world, which occurs 16 times across the piece. Sega's connection to the area and deaths such as Ella's are based on demographic similarities. In a podcast interview from June 2021, Sega said, oh, Sega said, that could have been me, like because I grew up in the area, I went to school in the same area, I'm also black, you know, that could have been me. In our world, his rapping and singing accelerates the flow of particulate matter through his own lungs. Situated on the South Circular, breathing those same pollutants which have harmed thousands, Sega's voice thus becomes the site of interaction between black working class bodies and smoggy London air. I want to think through our world in terms of what environmental humanities scholar Irma Allen dubs a political ecology of air, in which paying attention to breath helps us understand the politics of our embodied relations to air. In other words, breath is the site at which the relationships between humans and the air we rely on can be understood. Allen's is a feminist political ecology, which draws attention to the intersectional aspects of the relationship between air and breathing bodies. Considering Sega's Our World through the lens of a political ecology of air allows us to ask which bodies get to breathe which air. Like music and sound, air raises questions of permeability and leakage. It gets into the cracks. Breath and air also complicate the distinction between interior and exterior, blurring the distinctions between individual and shared aired environments. This has interesting consequences for thinking about grief. In focusing on the communal aspects of breathing, Sega in turn generates a musical understanding of grief as shared. Communities on the South Circular are more exposed to air pollution and individuals with underlying health conditions like Ella are even more vulnerable. The Our World of the song's title is a place in which to mourn the fact that their lived environment is not safe. The irony is that much of that mourning, that sung, spoken, breathed mourning is done in the very place where the air might kill you especially if you're BIPOC and or working class. Of course, it's not really the air where the problem lies, but the institutional and infrastructural failure to maintain healthy air quality in certain areas. Thinking about this with reference to a political ecology of air, it becomes clear that breathing in this music is not an equal act, but one traversed by vectors of race and class. The air in the English countryside locations where Cosmo recorded the birds is not the same air Sega breathes as he sings in traffic-saturated London. As Irma Allen puts it, where you breathe matters, who breathe counts. A sentiment reflected in the line Sega raps, which question, NO2 means something to me, but what does it mean to you? Or do you not care because you think you're in an area that's for the well to do? Our world draws attention to the listener's own embodied interaction with air, inviting questions about the injustices in our relations to the socio-natural world, which lead to breathing becoming deadly for some. 
Sega's exhortation then to fight for our air is where grief turns to action. Offering space to grieve environmental injustices, the single nonetheless leaves listeners with a mobilizing call to do something. It ends with the question, would you fight for your air? Because we all need to care. Internalized personal grief can transmute into the will to address climate injustice in the UK. This is also reflected in the co projects which accompanied our world. Billboards across South London raised awareness of the single and the issues it addresses. A comic strip illustrated by Sega's cousin, Andrew Kiwanuka, also foregrounds the voices of young BIPOC individuals who, upon realizing environmental damage is much closer to home than they realized, become environmentally engaged. Breathing here is a site of suffering, but also a site of resistance. Sega's project speaks to a commons of air, a grassroots expression of pain within a community as a way of healing. Our world is less about environmental degradation and more about what it is like to live and breathe with the consequences of it. These are public expressions of grief. In the literature and practice of therapy for grieving, sharing experiences is a central theme and is something which both Cosmo and Sega are evidently doing. Grief is not really a noun, but a verb. It's something we do. As ecological grief is only likely to increase in prevalence as we move further into the Anthropocene, I would suggest that there's an urgent need for cultural practices which help us carry out this process of grieving. Part of making sense of the ecological crises we're witnessing is the act of what Donna Haraway calls staying with the trouble, of living and dying with other humans and more than human species. Neither Cosmo nor Sega shy away from the trouble. On the contrary, their music embodies it. Death by anthropogenic environmental change not only raises questions about why that death has occurred, but is a questioning of those of us who remain behind. The very absence of voices, be they future lost species or present and future victims of air pollution, forces us to ask why we are the ones allowed to grieve, to survive beyond others. In using music to frame ecologies of both anticipatory and reactive grief, death and loss uncannily ask, why was this allowed to happen? And what will we do about it? Perhaps in there, there's hope. Thank you. Thank you very much, Rowan. Very interesting. I jotted down lots of questions and queries for later. Um, so let's uh, swiftly uh, move on. Um, our next speaker today is Alice, and she's going to talk um, about the divided reception of the United States versus Billy Holiday and Lady Day on screen. Without further ado, Alice, welcome and thank you. Great. Um, thanks, Beata, and thanks as well to all the organisers and to Rowan for that paper. I really enjoyed that. So let me just share my screen. Has that come up OK? Fantastic. OK. So I also just wanted to issue a quick content warning before I start. Um, I will be making two, uh, reference to drug abuse and alcoholism, as well as domestic abuse and um, death in this presentation. So um, if there's any of that that you'd prefer to set out, that's absolutely fine. So media coverage of Billie Holiday's life has long condensed it into a few broad themes. The jazz singer with the striking voice, born into poverty, plagued by racism, alcoholism, drug addiction, and domestic abuse, culminating in a tragic early death. Yet when Holiday's life is summarized into broad brush strokes like this, the public discourse surrounding her becomes simplified and frequently reductive. And there is a tendency to prioritize tawdry details over exploration of musical legacy. In my research into the posthumous careers of female singers who have died through misadventure, I have found that journalistic discourse works to remove agency by framing the artists as inherently vulnerable or sad. Discourse around figures as diverse as Holiday, Janis Joplin, Karen Carpenter, Whitney Houston, and Amy Winehouse tends to treat all of them in this way. Whilst the construction of meaning around each of these figures is based on the specificity of each of their lives and careers, the overall narratives, narrative arcs follow broadly similar trajectories. The purpose of these framings, I argue, is to neutralize the peril of transgressive femininity. A deviant woman poses less of a threat if she is not perceived to have been in control of her actions. 
Holiday is not an exception to this trend, with mediated retrospectives often framing her as a passive or figure, as a passive figure who lacks autonomy. So I'm going to begin by laying out some of the existing scholarship around Holiday's posthumous career, as well as some extracts from my own time in the archives as part of my PhD project, in order to lay out some of the most common trends in life writing around Holiday. I'll then briefly introduce 2021's The United States versus Billie Holiday, directed by Lee Daniels and starring Andrew Day, and explore how the mixed critical reception to the film might be indicative of a change in trend. One of the most important trends I've found across each of the artists that I've researched is the connection that commentators and audiences have forged between vocal timbre and personal life. Nina Sun Eidsheim's recent work into vocals Hambra demonstrates how audiences commonly believe that the sound of the voice expresses something essential of the speaker or singer. For Holiday, the sonic qualities of the voice are treated as a wellspring of meaning, and the idea that evidence of personal trouble is detectable in the voice appears frequently and becomes crucial to posthumous meaning making. So I'm going to lay out now some extracts that demonstrate this that I've come across in my archival research. So for example, writing in 2000, Martin Longley praises her ability to bring expressive gravitas to a song and adds that this is compounded by the deterioration of her vocals over time. Yet he quite crassly combines with, with her personal life, he says. She had a way of fully inhabiting her songs. Much has been made of Holiday's hard bitten life, the racism, the drugs, what he calls the passive acceptance of male abuse. The decline in her health during the final years resulted in a technically frayed voice, which arguably sharpened the cutting edge of her emotional expression." End quote. Here, Holiday's frayed voice and hard bitten life have become intertwined. Longley's problematic framing of Holiday's problems, I would say especially that comment about the passive acceptance of male abuse, I mean, the blame for any of that abuse should lie not with Holiday's passive, supposed passivity, but with the activity of those abusing her. It speaks volumes about the importance of suffering to the public reception of the diva. I think frayed itself is also an interesting term, one that, whilst describing degradation, also suggests exposure and vulnerability. The adjectives used to describe Tambra can tell us a lot about its perception because, as Cornelia Fails has illustrated, lack of academic attention means that we don't have that many specific terms and we tend to describe Tambra through metaphor. In this case, the adjectives and metaphors used work in the context of Holiday's biography and are consistent with a primary focus on the personal. The degradation of her voice also appears to have strengthened the potential for this association between voice and personal life. Writing in the New York Times, Stephen Holden describes how, Holiday's vocal deterioration brought her greater emotional depth and realism. Studying a chronology of her records is like following a roadmap of her life that takes you deep into the mountains over increasingly rugged terrain. The bumpier the road gets, the longer the view." End quote. Holden points to the increased emotional depth of the perhaps prematurely aging voice, but once more, this is framed explicitly through the lens of her life story. On a related note, Holiday is presented in the source materials as a singer who could extrapolate the emotions of a song and convey them in a commanding and compelling way. Her striking tone and her unconventional phrasing are a large part of this, and her ability to make songs take on genuine emotional expression is central to her legacy. Some discussions of this recognise Holiday's musicianship, yet many sources intrinsically link the musical and the personal. For example, Michael J. Renner claims that, one could argue that Holiday wouldn't be the singer she was were it not for her tragic life filled with racism, failed romances, drugs and alcohol. By the time of her mid 1950s recordings, Holiday's voice had deteriorated, but her approach to a lyric had deepened emotionally." End quote. Renner recognizes that there was work and skillful musicianship involved, yet this comes second again to Holiday's personal experiences. It's very common for discussions of this kind to place biography and musical material next to each other as though they were inextricably linked sometimes in ways that I would argue are quite simplistic, as per John Boogie, who simply says, 
Happiness, of course, was sometimes in tragically short supply in her life, and that sorrow came out in her sad, sweet sound." End quote. Emily Lordy argues that this conflation of Holiday's voice and personal life is a prominent pop cultural myth that has partly to do with the need for cautionary tales, as well as the spectacle of kind of celebrity gossip. She also, however, illustrates the problem with this, with this approach. She explores why the word haunting is so frequently applied to the song Strange Fruit, aside from its subject matter, and in great detail explains Holiday's unusual and striking approach to phrasing and the fact that she never performed the song in exactly the same way twice. There are several session and live recordings of Holiday's Strange Fruit from across her career, so naturally the effects of time and lifestyle on her voice can be traced through the song. Lordy explains the effect that that has on audiences, that they tend to um, feel that Holiday's voice is expressing something directly to them. The degradation of Holiday's voice has clearly had an impact on writing and her, and Lordy suggests that it is reductive to posit her changing vocals Hambra merely as a result of time and various vices, and that it can in fact be read as a deliberate musical technique. She says, even the infamous change in Holiday's voice does not confess what it seems to. Rather than hear Holiday's timbre as a window that can't help but express her tragic life, I hear Holiday herself as a timbral virtuoso who continues to use her different vocal colours and textures. End quote. What Lordy illustrates is the consideration that there is more to the unusual and striking tone of Holiday's voice than an audible reflection of what spectators think they know about her personal life. Certainly, as I've said, much life writing around Holiday prioritizes personal trouble over musicality. And Farah Jasmine Griffin discusses how framing Holiday's personal troubles centrally within her story is not only reductive, but it has harmful implica implications for black women as it is based on and perpetuates a stereotype of tragedy and trauma. Formulations of Holiday that frame her in terms of these negative stereotypes thus serve broader hegemonic ideological functions by preserving limiting notions of black womanhood. Of course, Holiday did face racially motivated persecution and discrimination throughout her lifetime, but the ways in which this is framed as confirmation of a, of a victimhood play into a limiting stereotype, especially in the ways in which these sources seem to remove her agency and her autonomy. When this stereotype is then presented as truth, it preserves existing social hierarchies by continuing to impose barriers. So what we have is a situation wherein Holiday is framed as a tragic victim, a simplistic and reductive account that dismisses her considerable musical influence. Yet recent coverage may demonstrate a shift away from this kind of thinking and more consideration of Holiday as a complex and multifaceted person has emerged in some of the later source materials I've collected for my project. Central framing of her musical legacy appears to have become more of a central concern in recent years. Her centenary year in 2015 especially seemed to see a significant shift in this, with some critics pointing out the imbalance between coverage of Holiday's personal life and musical influence. Ben Ratliff, for example, suggests that we move beyond a singer's tragedy, saying that it's not enough to see her as a passive or static entity, a victim, a sufferer, a collection of vocal mannerisms. The closer you look, the less she seems stuck in her time. She sang with Count Basie, Artie Shaw, and Benny Goodman in the 1930s and recorded Strange Fruit in 1939, a brave and piercing meditation on American racism. For decades after her death, she was understood as a doomed hero. The change in that understanding has come slowly ever since." End quote. Ratliff here moves away from this conflation of song and biography, referring to the enduring power of the song itself and Holiday's courage in her persistence in performing it. Crucially, some of Holiday's agency is restored in this account. Strange Fruit, needless to say, has maintained its power since Holiday first performed it. It is Time Magazine's song of the 20th century. 
And previous considerations of the song, such as observations in David Margolick's book, Cafe Society, focus on the rows concerning the authorship, and on occasion make this really a logical reference to Holiday not fully an- understanding the song which is an absolute nonsense that, according to Angela Davis, perpetuates myths of gendered and raced inferiority. Yet Ratliff recognises not only the song's power, but also the personal and professional difficulties she opened herself up to by continuing to perform it. In this account, Ratliff recognises Holiday's autonomy as a musician, a frame distinctly lacking in the earlier extracts examined. In terms of academic discourse, John Shred published Billie Holiday, The Musician and the Myth in 2015, which primarily focuses on Holiday as a singer. The book provides a necessary corrective to life writing that has served ideological ends, and he provides a detailed musicological account of her vocal craft. Reviews of this book point to a shift in perspective in journalistic discourse, such as this one from Seth Coulter Wallace, who points out that, Plenty of stars from yesteryear had crazy juicy personal lives. Very few left behind conceptual approaches that inspire in so many directions. This book encourages us to consider musicianship as the defining characteristic of Lady Day's legacy." End quote. Neil Spencer likewise claims that upon reading the book, what the reader is left with is not Holiday's familiar ravaged private life, but the triumph of a unique creative talent. End quote. Several sources examined here have either disregarded Holiday's musical legacy entirely or else framed it as inextricably bound to her, her biography. In these, source, these two sources, through their celebration of Shred's work, it appears that the imbalance between focus on personal strife and musical legacy might be beginning to be redressed. The divided critical reception of the United States versus Billie Holiday, which came out earlier this year, has interesting implications for my project and beyond. Whilst the performances in the film were largely acclaimed, Andrew Day, for example, who who plays Holiday and who is excellent, received an Oscar nomination for her performance. Um, Critics have questioned whether the film prioritizes traumatic experiences over musical legacy and why we seem to view Holiday through the eyes of of the men in her life when we watch the film. Indeed, whilst I am focusing on critical reception rather than the film itself in this paper, it must be said that it it does rely on some of the archetypes around the tragic jazz singer trope, and I'll I'll play a clip in a minute. For example, A.O. Scott has pointed to the film's tendency to diminish artistic technique. He says, We see Holiday as a heroin user, a devoted but not always reliable friend, an operatic figure of towering pain and sublime resilience, but not really as an artist. The United States versus Billie Holiday shows little interest in the discipline and craft that made those indelible nightclub and concert hall moments possible." End quote. The film has also proved controversial in its portrayal of Jimmy Fletcher, an undercover federal agent sent to spy on Holiday. It centres him as a love interest based on Johan Harry's claim in his book Chasing the Scream, his account of the war on drugs. This is, though, a disputed claim, and so critics have questioned Fletcher's central framing in the film, particularly the ways in which he is presented as a caring and positive influence. As Roxana Haddadi has pointed out, even fictional men seem to play a more central role in the biopic than its subject. So I'm going to play a clip from towards the beginning now um, to show how uh, this romance with Jimmy Fletcher is set up as a central facet of the plot. So I'm going to reshare because that worked better when we um, when we had a tech run through earlier. So um, has that come up okay again? Okay, great. Um, I'm just going to play a short clip now. <laughs> Let's start where it all began, at the Cafe Society. Okay, so it's it's seems to have decided it won't be... Uh... I'm just going to see if I can get it to show the uh, video as well. Uh, movies... They just want me to shut up and sing all of me. 
Let's start where it all. Okay, so <laughs> um, the visuals are quite important there. So I think what I'm going to do instead of playing the audio is, is uh, to sort of describe what happens. Um, has the presentation has come up again though? Okay, good. <laughs> so what happens is we um, cut to a holiday in a nightclub performing All of Me, and we've got these three very central facets of the plot being set up. So um, she has just discussed Strange Fruit and um, her decision to keep on performing it in spite of like quite a lot of resistance uh, with that radio, with the um, person who's interviewing her. And then we get people being set up central characters in the plot like her manager and her husband and then Jimmy Fletcher walks in oh thanks yeah said Jimmy Fletcher walks in and is set up as a very central figure and we do we sort of look at holiday through his eyes so I'm really sorry that that hasn't worked um but there we go <laughs> so Peter Bradshaw uh claims that there is something tonally very odd about elevating this imagined love affair to an accepted part of her life, with sensitive G-man dreamboat Fletcher supposedly hanging around. That is especially so when, in real life, Billie Holiday's magnificent courage and defiance took place in spite of men and their reactionary bullying." End quote. So this framing follows a trajectory where the men in the story are the ones with power. Although the majority of men in my thesis have been posited as villains in public discourse, presenting them as heroes serves a similar kind of purpose. In narrative framings like this, autonomy and agency are in the male domain. As Adadi says further in her review, quote, it uses men to speak about Holiday's importance, aura and appeal without giving the same opportunities to the character herself, end quote. So Holiday is not granted as much agency or autonomy as she should be in her own story in the film. So to conclude, in my research, I've discovered that complexities in the stories of female singers have been repeatedly simplified, including Holiday's. And so this reconsideration of nuance in the discourse is very significant. It books the trend of the vast majority of the source materials that I've collected. And it is a more complex construction of the stories of women like Holiday in public discourse that I argue for in my thesis. And I'm hopeful that this slight change in direction of narrative trajectory indicates a broader reconsideration. However, these changes in trend remain in their early stages and do not outweigh the general overall sentiments in the data I've collected for this research. Further investigation will be needed here to discover whether this shift in narrative trajectory is likely to continue or if it might be an anomaly. I intend to trace this beyond the scope of my PhD as these changes in discourse are often long-term, slowly moving shifts. Yet the change is small but significant and proof of the malleability of posthumous careers and the social and ideological ends that their construction often serves. So there are the sources I used to put this together. Um, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Alice. Sorry, it didn't work out with the video, but I, I think no, we've got I'm a good sorry. idea <laughs> of your main argument and your description. So thanks. Um, and uh, late, let's, <laughs> let's, uh, let's uh, swift uh, move on to our uh, final presentation in that session and that is uh, Adriana giving a presentation <laughs> on performance and feminism by and excuse me if I don't pronounce it correctly <laughs> Sashi almost it's Sashi <laughs> oh, oh. it's okay <laughs> thank you very much no, uh, no. so discussing feminism yet again from a different yes. perspective I'm well excited about this so here we go thank you Adriana Thank you so much. Okay, so uh, thank you everyone for uh, organizing the conference and for having me. <laughs> it's a very um, big pleasure to be here presenting my, um, well, future PhD. It will hopefully grow up to be a PhD. So uh, I also have a disclaimer as I start. Um, the presentation will uh, include some, let's say, explicit content. Uh, it, show images of uh, nearly naked female bodies. So just um, be advised <laughs> regarding that. So um, 
my, uh, I will start from my case study today. <clears throat> her um, real name is Ivana Rašić and um, her artistic name is Saisi MC. And she is a very well-known Serbian hip hop artist. She began her career in the early 2000s and uh, issues of femininity, feminism, female sexuality, empowerment, they have all been uh, and had an important place in her music and her public image. And uh, she also regularly addresses them in her interviews and songs. And um, as what we would call a woman in hip hop, that is a woman working in a predominantly male context, she openly discusses her own position as a woman surrounded by men, working in a field defined by male standards, and she emphasizes the importance of feminism for her work. So this, is, this was the starting point and one of the reasons why I chose her as my case study. So since uh, she has been working and active for a very long time, and it's quite difficult to uh, touch on everything she did and all aspects of her art, I'm going to play a video. I kind of meshed uh, four of her music videos together. The, the end result is not very, of very good quality, but I hope it will give you um, some idea of, of what, who she is and what she does. Ja sam feministkinja, da li mrziš me? Ja sam lezbika, hajde tuci me! Ja sam sveštenica, osveštam ti grehe, radim bolje nego papa Ja sam papa, ne postoji drugi papa, samo moj trademark Mlada državnica, držim te blizu sebe, predsjednica misica So, I, <laughs> I know you didn't understand much, but uh, this was just a kind of audiovisual <laughs> demonstration. So um, before I um, go into more details about um, SICI, I would um, just like to uh, share a few ideas that have actually um, governed my research into her and some other case studies as well. So one of the starting points of my thinking here is the fact that today what we call women's right, rights or what we call feminism, which is understood in almost countless ways, at least in the global north, they have become omnipresent and they're unstable categories. They are perpetually being created, affirmed, denounced, negotiated, appropriated by public figures and governments and stars of the entertainment industry, as well as ordinary people. 
And my outlook on this particular case study is thus influenced by the writings of those authors um, who actually focus on how the fluid and ever-changing category of feminism is being constructed in the neoliberal contexts and in relation to neoliberal ideologies and how such a category is employed in the process of formation of uh, contemporary femininities and how it's um, employed and commodified and mediated via the popular culture. So uh, I'm referring to Angela McCrubbie and Rosalind Gill and uh, Diane Negra and all those, um, a very large body of, of authors. And um, these writings emphasize also the fact that, um, despite the fact that um, it's a very um, individualized category and label, um, the constructions of feminism, at least in the mainstream discourses, affirm certain constants like uh, we usually equate it with empowerment, with freedom, with sexual liberation. And I'm, of course, speaking again about the mainstream discourse, the popular culture. So uh, these um, yeah, mainstream, very visible um, discourses. And uh, such constants are, uh, however, infused with numerous meanings in the process uh, of construction of particular femininities. And in my case, they interact with various other elements of local and regional femininities as well as with other dynamic processes of the music industry, which as we know itself operates through processes of borrowing, transmission, appropriation, negotiation of different elements and influences, which is also very visible in the music of Saisi, which is very diverse and uh, very different. Um, so one um, important conclusion of the writers I'm, uh, I was inspired by here is the fact that um, uh, feminism has mainly been equated with what, let's say, in the academia or in the feminist discourse, we would recognize as liberal gains of Western second wave feminism. And thus, it can refer to many things. It can be a political denomination, a personal lifestyle, marketing strategy, and so on. And um, for example, Tisha Dejmani has noted that such categories have become what she calls empty signifiers. And they were, quote, applicable to whatever issue, product or behavior need to be sold to women as dictated by social, cultural and economic conditions, unquote. And as Rosalind Gill has noted, there is a distinct, as she says, ordinariness and everydayness of contemporary ideas, which can be labeled as feminist and has pointed to their, quote, ability to speak to sense and meaning making about gender that has become as taken for granted as neoliberal ideas, unquote. So in other words, what scholars and researchers and feminists, what we read as feminism in popular culture has in many ways become part of an ordinary way, ordinary under quotes, uh, way in which femininities are performed, especially in the area of popular culture and music. So my goal today will be to very briefly uh, discuss how feminism is, const is constructed by and performed by Sci CMC and how such a label is used in the context of the music industry as a means to uh, reach a wider audience and offer them a specific product for consumption. So um, I hope it was visible from the, the mix I played. She performs a very hybrid style of music. Uh, she is often and actually always um, understood as a hip hop artist, but um, in as much as she speaks or, or raps in her uh, music, but actually um, her music really meanders between elements of hip hop and pop and dance and folk music, depending basically on uh, the producer or, or the beat maker who um, will make her, her music. She is the one who um, actually um, writes the lyrics and she, um, in, envisions her um, her performance, the visual presentation. And most of her songs are also performed uh, with her sister, uh, Tiana. We saw her in the third video, especially. So Tiana sings and uh, Ivana or Saisi raps. So they're like a, a duo. And um, also uh, Saisi performs her music within the context of the urban culture of Serbia. And I would say the privileged. Uh, part of, of the society. She um, really performs this uh, very urban, very posh um, woman. She very often uses Belgrade slang in her, in her music. She also uses English phrases, so on and so on. Um, and in her songs and videos, she actually, as I mentioned, performs very different 
um, images of femininity. Here uh, we have her as a, as a saint, then she very often turns to Baroque, to Rococo. There is always, um, there are also images of her as a dominatrix, as a stripper, as a wife, as a bride. So she kind of uh, tries to present and sometimes deconstruct these um, different roles or stereotypes of, of females. And uh, I would say she performs what Rosalind Gill uh, would label as sexual subjectification. Uh, she uses the term to refer to, um, uh, to images of, quote, sexually autonomous heterosexual young woman who plays with her sexual power and is forever up for it, unquote, or what other, other authors have labeled as sexual entrepreneurship or feminine libidinal entrepreneurship or sexual agency which are all the terms that point to the process in which a woman adopts what can be described as objectification or she takes in these stereotypes about um, female body and then she uses them to achieve a goal um, whether it's um, social um, well some kind of material gain career advancement or uh, advancement in the music business and this is what Saisi has been employing uh, for two decades very successfully so um, she also expects a label of feminism to be attached to her work. These are very uh, questions that very often are asked by um, the well, her fans as well as journalists. And she actually welcomes this um, this label, and she openly promotes those values in her interviews and public appearances. And uh, she actually puts what um, has been called open displays of feminine sexuality in a feminist context. So this form of subversion of traditional femininity through its connection with feminism is also achieved through more extreme lyrics or sometimes not just um, explicit uh, displays of, of the female body, but also, for example, focusing on some less sexy, more real aspects of the female body, like gynecological exams, for example. In the first song, uh, she actually makes a reference to the pap smear and then uh, plays with uh, the similarity between the word for pap smear in uh, Serbian and the term for pope, which is why there was a, a pope, a Superman pope at the beginning. And um, she uh, actually, in the last song I played, she refers to um, the <laughs> workings or the anatomy of a vagina and so on. And these are all actually designed to push that boundary and to provoke the audience, to provoke the reaction of the public morale and so on. And they're also um, sometimes, how to say, filled or, or juxtaposed with um, an elitist approach to art. She is also often commented on the fact that um, she doesn't want everyone to understand her art, but this is something that is creative. Her lyrics are deeper. They have some more serious meaning and so on. And this is also explicit. For example, this is an homage to Marina Abramovic. So um, she, she doesn't shy away from, from um, this academic or more educated um, audience. And what she promotes as feminism and this is what is interesting for me, how feminism is constructed and reconstructed as we use it as, as a, a label and a term to, to uh, explain something. She actually uh, uses it in a kind of academic uh, way. She often emphasizes that she studied um, at the Faculty of Political Sciences. Um, and she actually adopts the discourse of human rights, standing against violence, against women always, she promotes an individualistic approach to feminism, and she equates it with empowerment and sexual freedom, mostly in her interviews. And she very well um, responds to what is actually mainly understood as feminism in contemporary Serbia's mainstream discourses. This is what most people understand as, as feminism. And for example, uh, in 2017, a uh, feminist collective called BFM for uh, Belgrade Feminist Festival, they recognize her work with an award for feminist initiative in pop culture. And she is also listed as one of the lecturers uh, in a school of media literacy. Um, there were actually some uh, students writing papers on her and she is uh, sometimes also uh, not well, provocative to academic <laughs> analysis. She was also the uh, godmother of this year's Belgrade Pride. They always have some uh, pop 
culture icon to sort of um, play at the party at the end. So uh, she's also very big on um, LGBTIQ rights. She promotes this to, to her fans as well. And um, she also speaks about how um, in hip hop and in popular music, female sexuality is shown, but in a predictable way. And there is a limit that shouldn't be crossed. Otherwise, such a performance would be labeled as vulgar. And in an interview uh, she gave for a very popular um, online internet show, she actually stated that she precisely means to push those boundaries, to openly and explicitly show her sexuality and to kind of even annoy people with that, to irritate and so on. And interestingly for me, she stated that feminism is a natural thing, uh, kind of common sense. It shouldn't be something radical. It's something that we all have to adopt and it's so logical and, and normal. And uh, for her, it represents solidarity with other women, helping them understand their own position in the society, educating them and helping them fight for something better. So um, she has thus indeed pushed the boundaries of how femininity is constructed and represented within local music industry precisely by uh, through this provocation and this kind of overdoing in a, in a very well-designed way. And she walks this fine line between meeting expectation of how a woman should act and look and pushing those expectations beyond the limit, stepping into the field of provocation, excess and so on. And I think that's why um, she also uh, sticks to the field of hip hop because uh, these things have been uh, present for a while. My first um, association is always Nicki Minaj with her Harayaku Barbie persona and this kind of overdoing of, of female sexuality. And she has done a very important job of promoting feminism to her fans, introducing these ideas into the public sphere. Her work, as well as uh, public and stage persona, however, also reveal that certain signifiers of feminism are being commodified uh, through the workings of the music industry in Serbia as well. And um, that they can now be offered for consumption without their connection to mainly second wave feminism and its politics. Because if you do not go further into her music or listen to her interviews, you wouldn't necessarily pick up the feminist. Uh, it's, it's very uh, in the details. So it can be said that precisely due to feminism entanglement with capitalism and the music market, she was able to formulate her promotional strategy by balancing between performing a very well thought out heterosexy femininity suitable for a male gaze, a femininity that is also aggressive and empowered, and but always heterosexual with, I think, a few, uh, few exceptions. And she doesn't dismiss the more traditional features of the female um, of femininity. She has a very slim figure, always shows cleavage, there's the long hair, makeup, high heels, and so on. But there is also a more progressive feminist agenda that is, I would say, also aimed at urban audiences who have come to expect and appreciate this uh, politically engaged, um, these politically engaged musicians and artists. So I see I have, <laughs> I'm kind of at my limit, so I will stop here and be happy to answer uh, any additional questions and inquiries <laughs> later. Okay, thank you very much, Ariana. Very interesting presentation again. Uh, and I'd like to open up to the floor. So if you have any questions, you can use the chat, but bear with me doing it at the same time, or just raise your hand. Um, if there are any specific questions to any of our three wonderful speakers, then let's go ahead. Any, okay, maybe then I can start. <laughs> oh, okay, no, Alex, I see your hand raised, please. Uh, please no, please start, I'll, I'll just follow, I'll go after you. If you, want, if you want right, okay, so I've, um, I've got uh, my first question, I'm just going through my order here, um, is for Rowan. And um, <coughs> what I was wondering, so th this is a new topic to me, uh, very interesting, but I, what I was wondering is whether the use of music in grief, this particular kind of grief, um, offers a new quality to grieving, or whether this is something that has been expressed in different ways, but is now made auditory. 
Yeah, that's a really interesting point. Um, I I think in because ecological grief is is different in kind um, from other types of grief in that it's, it's it's very distributed. It's hard to pin down sometimes, especially when it's anticipatory, when it comes before before an actual loss. Um, I think it's a type of grief that needs thinking through in a different way. Um, whether music already has that capability, though, I think is another issue, because I think it's particularly well suited to thinking about that type of um, type of grieving and thinking because um, because it is shared. It's um, it's kind of it's, it's often a non-verbal representation as well. Um, of grief, which, you know, some, sometimes people find it hard to put into words what it is that about ecological anxiety or grief they're feeling. Um, and I think sometimes expressing in other ways uh, aids that. Um, yeah, I'm not I'm not sure if I've answered that. But yeah, I think there's kind of two two points there that yes, there is this is a different type of grief, but also potentially music already has um, or is giving us the tools to address that. Yeah, I think I was coming from the perspective of if I think of field recordings of birds that are on the endangered list compared to music that has been made based on field recordings of birds that are on the endangered yeah. list. So yeah. what element does the the kind of the making of the music with those sounds add? What 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 kind of layer does it add in how we deal or how we consume or how we how we interact with that sort of grief? Yeah, I think um, it does transform it. It's obviously not such a um, direct way of hearing those birds' voices. They are manipulated by um, a person. Um, I guess the for for kind of the listeners that I've come across of Cosmo Sheldrake's music, it is this idea that they are quite used to hearing that bird song, but it's not his music. Kind of brings to the forefront the fact that it's lessening and it kind of comes back to this idea that um birdsong it has been uh, kind of getting less and less common throughout the uk for a few decades now there's some quite interesting recent research on that um but it's not something that we can easily notice or conceptualize because um it's it's kind of intergenerational so your grandparents might think oh this used to sound different but by the time you get a couple of generations down the, the baseline of what is normal has shifted. Um, so I think kind of changing those sounds and making them into more of what humans see as music. A lot of people would argue that birdsong is also a type of music. Um, I think that kind of adds a dimension of um, bringing to the forefront what has changed rather than thinking, oh, that's lovely. There's, there's some, uh, you know, an owl, um, calling whereas actually um, it kind of brings that idea that you're hearing this now and you're hearing a very um sort of maybe an anthropomorphic idea of what those sounds are like but also this as kind of one of the comments suggested on the youtube videos it's kind of acting as a record uh, it's kind of saying what is going to be lost um so yeah, I think I think it does function quite differently from just field recordings. It functions kind of more as a um, making it real for some people, maybe, um, and kind of saying to them, "This is how this particular musician is thinking about bird song." Um, maybe they notice it more in their daily lives. Thank you. Thanks. Any any other questions for Rona or anybody else? Okay, uh, Hamad, do you've got your hand up, um, please? Yes, I, I, I have a question for Adriana. So uh, first of all, really interesting artist you mentioned. Um, <laughs> I'm glad actually, I'm gonna check it out. I wanted to ask you as a researcher, mm -hmm. do you see this artist as a musician or uh -huh. <laughs> someone who does everything and music is just one thing they do? Uh -huh. Excellent question. <laughs> yeah. um, I think, uh, in her case, we might um, not do very well with those um, 
well-known categories like a musician, producer, and, and so on. Um, she has actually been called out many times that she's not even a rapper and that she is not a singer and like, what are you? <laughs> but she has kind of used this um, as her own special thing, <laughs> uh, something to promote herself further and actually has used feminism in this uh, sense as well uh saying or not really feminism but some kind of a reference to how a woman in a male dominated world doing something different um can kind of have a, a very hard time but uh she um i i don't know what to say i i think i i call her an artist mainly or or simply use a uh, pronouns because um she i think defies uh these labels but um she has mostly whatever I read and even some um, academic articles, especially uh, those uh, on portals and uh, Internet pages and so on. They all refer to her as a hip hop or rap artist because she does speak <laughs> or, or rap. And I really didn't want to go into that because that would open like a whole new can of worms. And um, how she sees herself and whether uh, if you don't sing, you are automatically a rapper. And how would we uh, even define this music in terms of a genre or a style? <laughs> so this is all very, very interesting, but it's one of the features of, it's why she is, I think, so popular because she does so many different things and then she attracts so many different audiences and so many different people. Thank you. Right, any more, any more questions? Alex, go on. Right, yeah, so I, I kind of have questions for everyone, but I'll ask a question um, for Alice here. Um, thank you everyone for the presentation. I thought they were really interesting. Um, so my question is kind of relating. So you've got, with Billie Holiday, there's like a, a wealth of history there and there's a wealth of writing and criticism. So when you get to a point in which you can kind of see sort of attitudes changing in terms of like re reappraising her work, um, which you said there's been a lot more of that in the past 10 years or so. Um, I was wondering, have you thought of, uh, have you sort of seen patterns with maybe correlate artists who have a smaller historical precedent or a smaller career? And so there's this sort of like immediate sort of reductive ascriptions on how these artists should work and how they should perform and act. And then there's a change. Is it, does it take, what we're trying to say is, is how long, have you noticed how long it might take for a revisionist history to take hold? Is it that there's just there's a, a long period of time until kind of people can counteract that? Or do you think the particular moment that we're in means that those sort of regressive ideas are kind of more quickly rebutted, if that makes sense? Yeah, that makes perfect sense. And it's a really good question. Thank you. Um, I haven't come across it so much in my other case studies, no, all of whom um, died after. So the others are Janice Joplin. Karen Carpenter, Amy Winehouse and Whitney Houston. I did see a bit of it over the summer when it had been the 10th anniversary of Amy Winehouse's death and there was some reappraising going on. Um, but even then some of the underlying assumptions there were still a little bit reductive and there was still, a, I mean, some, some documents were great. And also I should point out as well, I'm talking very much in terms of journalistic discourse, um, especially in terms of Billie Holiday, like there's a whole body of brilliant work it's like I'm thinking particularly of Angela Davis uh Farrah Jasmine Griffin and Emily Lordy and their work on Billie Holiday which is fantastic and really nuanced and really thoughtful so it's more journalistic discourse um so I did see a bit of nuance coming back into the sort of way Amy Winehouse's story is framed over the summer but again that was only July um so I guess I guess my answer to your question is I hope so. I hope it will start to not take as long. I mean, Billie Holiday died in 1959 and kind of it feels a shame that, you know, I've been spending all this time looking at newspaper archives and I'm just starting to see kind of a bit of nuance coming out. Um, yeah, so I do, finding so far would suggest that it takes quite a long time um, but as I said, I did see a little bit over the summer as well. So I'm hoping to be able to kind of um, keep tracing it. Does that answer your question? Yeah, completely. Thank you. And it's really good to hear about yeah, the other case studies as well. So I was, I was thinking more of, sort of yeah, Amy Winehouse and reception. Yeah. And, you know, critical thought. 
Thank you. Right. Okay. So thank you very much again to our speakers, Rowan, Alice, and Adriana, for the for soldiering through the first session. A uh, lot of new ideas here. We're going to take a little break, and uh, I'm just checking with Alex because you did the tech check with the speakers before the next yeah. session. Is that also going to be the case now? So everyone, yeah, everyone's has been checked. So it's great, really excellent. Today. So it's a real break. Yeah, a real break. So if everyone can come back at um, six o'clock on the dot. And we'll have um, session two. So yeah, thanks again, everyone, for participating in that really um, enlivening session. And we'll see you in about 10, 12 minutes. See you in a bit.